Warning, the voices heard in this video are made synthetically using artificial intelligence. Nothing in this video reflects anything actually stated by the real-life individuals involved. This video is for entertainment purposes only, and serious political content will be avoided for that purpose. Enjoy! Welcome back, viewers. After we have defeated the physical and psychological torture of Darkspawn Chronicles, it feels amazing to be back in the commander's seat for the base game. I have a ton of content planned today for you all, but first I better take care of this last demon that Joe unleashed during his episode. Now, Barack, I see you over there salivating to tell the viewers some lore, so why don't you go ahead and lay it on us, brother, while I demon slay? Thank you, Donald. So, viewers, this rage demon here reveals a bit as to how spirits and demons are created, as this rage demon was created by the powerful thoughts and distractions of ancient mages, either in the Fade or before the Fade was created. That, however, isn't the most interesting lore fact in this quest. This boss drops Usaris, an ancient blade from the time of Danes and Ferelden before Andraste. Usaris is not only a unique looking blade, but it is also one of the two blades featured in the main menu screen, right in front of Asala, which is Sten's sword. It's weird they keep such a prominent weapon behind a fairly unnoticeable side quest. Anyways, Donald, it's time to show off your Riz good luck, big guy. I am surprised how agreeable you are being with this, Joe. I was expecting you to go into Morrigan's romance kicking and screaming. Come here, girl. I found your book, and I know you've been needing a little love. Just a quick reward for Papa Trump. Given the fact she is much taller than us, she must be on her knees right now to reach eye level with us. Papa Trump wants uppies, mommy. Dog, what the actual hell? I think Donald is going to be completely lost in the sauce, Barry. Just keep in mind that this is all thanks to your compromise. Remember that next time. Oh, please, if we went with Liliana, you would be wearing a dog collar. And doing the same damn thing, Joe, I just wanted the Smackdown Fridays in the Oval Office to end at least over the fictional women. Damn baby, you just can't get enough of the Trump Tower, can you? We just kissed and you are already coming back. You know, I would normally have some questions over how she has already read the entire grimoire in two minutes of game time. But I think it's worth noting that between the cuts and loading screens, we had the boat ride off the tower, then the walk all the way back to camp from the boat. And I imagine an hour or two to settle into camp, so I guess it's not too unrealistic. Well, now Morrigan's going to give us not only a big reveal on Flemeth, but also her actual quest and lay out why her companion quest is actually one of the most difficult quests in the game to handle. Many daughters over her long lifetime. There are stories of these many witches of the wilds throughout chastened legend, yet I have never seen a one and always wondered why not. And now I know. They are all Flemeth. When her body becomes old and wizened, she raises a daughter, and when the time is right, she takes her daughter's body for her own. So it's important to note here that Morrigan is correct and incorrect about Indeed. Flemeth's intentions that at the same time. As we know, Flemeth is mythal, so it's highly unlikely that Flemeth's line in the grimoire about needing to possess daughters to stay alive is accurate, is mythal, is very likely keeping her body alive. However, Morrigan does have a right to still be afraid because I believe Flemeth's intention here was for Morrigan to grow independent and powerful so that Mythal could transfer to a new host while the body of Flemeth dies. We learn from Dragon Age 2 that Flemeth intended for Morrigan to kill her during the Blight. So it's likely she let the Templars take the book since it really didn't have information that would be harmful to Flemeth herself so that Morrigan could one day retrieve, read it, and defeat Flemeth. Do not be sorry. I am not. But why do all that instead of just possessing her after training her? Well, because Morrigan could not only become more magically powerful, but also more worldly, traveling the country with us, since that would be a far more useful body to inhabit. It's also likely traveling around would bring Morrigan to willingly seek Flemeth out, rather than forcing her, since I don't think it was ever Mythal's intention to possess as someone who was unwilling. Flemeth herself was willing, and I imagine only if Morrigan was willing would this have gone down, the way Morrigan is saying here. Well, thanks for the yap, but from a role play perspective, our girlfriend is telling us her life is in danger and we have to kill the witch god to protect her. So this is a no-brainer here. True enough, and if you refuse to help her here, she will leave the party? 
I must have is her true grimoire. With it, I can defend against her. True enough, but thankfully there is no time limit to finish this quest. It is just the act of outright refusing to confront Flemeth that sets off Morrigan's crisis point and causes her to leave. You can also simply spare Flemeth and trick Morrigan into believing she's dead. But I don't think even the writers think many players chose that option. Also, given who is playing today, I know we are about to fight a major boss in our Dragon Age run. Yeah, I brought a few spare keyboards just in case today, Barry. But before that, I think we need a little motivation for fighting Flemeth. The time that everyone has been waiting for is finally coming. Hing oh, God, Joe, take cover and grab my earmuffs. Oh, God, boys, get me my dune popcorn bucket. I'm about to erupt. Extra salt or extra butter, good buddy? Both. Good. Then let us waste no more time with foolish talk. Enligt alla kända lager av flyg, det finns inget sätt ett bi ska kunna flyga. Dess vingar är för små för att få dess feta lilla kropp från marken. Biet flyger förstås ändå för bin bryr sig inte vad människor tror är omöjligt. Gul, svart, gul, svart, gul, svart, gul, svart, och svart och gult. Låt oss skaka om det lite. Barry, frukosten är klar. Oming, vänta en sekund. Hallå, Barry? Congrats on your first time, Donald. You're a true inspiration to gamers that it is never too late. First time the fuck you mean? I'm not a damn virgin. I am a billionaire with multiple wives and affairs. Congrats on your cherry pop, Donald. Let's bring out a good Oval Office scotch to celebrate the big day slugger. I hate you both. Because the Grey Wardens are by nature so very healthy. I enjoy the thought that tis a little... You know, maybe it's the context we just saw, but I am just now noticing that we are at perfect eye level of Morgan's assets. That's my man Joe. Now you know why the Morrigan robes stay on. That is entirely up to you. Simply know that I have no designs on your independence. I wish All right, that was some top tier motivation, Donald can't lie. But Donald, I really think we should train a bit more first before fighting Flemeth. She is one of the top three bosses in Dragon Age by a mile. Oh, please, remember who you're talking to? I never back down and I never surrender. Damn well, get ready for round two of the Mage Hideout Boys. Oh, you've been watching us shale how recently because we might need to have a conversation. Given the fact shale doesn't sleep, I think it's fair to say she saw the whole tango. Possible foreshadowing incoming with that one, Joe. That's top tier shale. How would you rate my performance? Any tips or tricks? Well, looks like we have raised Shale's opinion of us, too. Everyone's approval has been evening out nicely here. Granted, it's mostly through gifts, but still, I think we will soon get the best ending out of everyone if we keep this up. Funnily enough, when Shale asked about our special lineage, it relates to our origin, and while some Warden's lineage is very special, like nobility, Dalish or Mage, the two commoner origins, can have the Warden relay that there is nothing special about them. Well, I am glad that we can relay to Shale that we are simply built different and simply a cut above the average dude. Well, glad to see you're following the rule finally of two-party interactions, Donald. Yeah, it's easy now that I'm not gooning out and finally got lucky anyway. Since our approval with Shale is going, well, let's check in on our bro Alistair since we haven't really talked to him since episode four. Good call, Donald. We can get some more lore on the Grey Wardens while we are at it. And it is very relevant before we enter the deep roads. I see you cooking. I'm that easy to read, huh, Barack? I remember someone in the comments criticizing Duncan for not revealing all the details about becoming a Grey Warden, but truthfully, from what Alistair says here, it sounds like it's common practice in the Wardens to not talk about the effects until they come up naturally, kind of like a don't ask. Don't tell policy. Yeah, I always just took becoming a Grey Warden from Duncan's perspective, where he says it will be a commitment where we will have to say goodbye to our former life. He doesn't elaborate why that is, but that right there is enough for me to understand what I'm getting into. The whole joining of Grey Wardens is ironically very morally gray itself. On one hand, it involves blood magic and is a death sentence, ultimately neither of which is fully revealed until after the point of no return. But on the other hand, Grey Wardens really only conscript during a blight or when the circumstances deem that it's either Grey Wardens or death. Anyway, plus Grey Wardens are ultimately needed for blights and to overall contain the Darkspawn situation. Good points, boys. Also, weird plot hole our warden here could ask why Grey Wardens go to Orzammar during, during their calling, which our warden would 100% not 
know why they are sent there given that we live there all our life. Yeah, the developers are allowed to miss something every now and then. That is definitely just an oversight. I know we have said it earlier, but Alistair really can't catch a break with the father figures. His own dad couldn't raise him. Eamon got whipped into giving him up, and now Duncan is dead. Honestly, instead of putting Duncan in our fade dream, I am surprised he didn't put Duncan's in his, since his death really does stick with him all through this game. Very true, Joe. I'm actually surprised his ideal world didn't have Duncan. But maybe that's because... In Alistair's ideal world, he doesn't have to be a warden, and he can have a normal life and loving family. So Duncan would just remind him of the unpleasant aspect of being a warden. Well, it's time to finally hit the road, Jack. And you call me old. Oh, right, I almost forgot about these little cutscenes here. They really double the animation cost just to show a highly detailed low-gain scowl this is our first introduction to how in this playthrough, since we didn't pick Human Noble, but I imagine for players like you, Donald, who picked Human Noble for their first playthrough, your blood rage shot up, revealing that these two work together. A excellent setup by Bioware here, and it helps make Human Noble a top-tier origin. I literally broke my desk in half when I saw that smug little bitch suckling Logan's ass cheeks and being buddy-buddy with him. For, uh, Low gain shot up to the top of my shit list after that. That explains a lot. All right, I know we hate Low gain, but come on, he is being relatable here. How often has a advisor come into our office yapping about something we couldn't care less about? And we just nod like that half listening. Valid. Damn, look at that handsome devil. Wait, hold on, Barack, you're a Tegan simp and a Zevran simp? You definitely have a pretty boy preference. Eat a dick. Don't worry, Barry. We will see both your husbandos very soon. Once again, thanks to you two Democrats, I get a scripted gank during my playtime from something you did. I think you would appreciate Behaz grind, said Donald. He scammed the Circle Enchanters about a book that was written by the maker himself that was rumored to provide immortality. Yeah, so? He sold them the book for 479 gold sovereigns plus favors. And given the fact he has a mage in his party, it's possible the enchanters gave them a mage as a manservant to help pay for the book. Holy shit, that's more like it. Can we be business partners instead of fighting him? Unfortunately, bro doesn't think that far ahead it would have been nice to have a speech check to just shake him down for money, but instead we have to fight him here. At least he drops a cool cow. Well, time to unveil my strategy going forward. I bought Shale a physical tomb that gave him a skill point so I could put a point in Stone Aura. Stone Aura gives all party members in it increased attack and defense, as well as HP and mana regeneration. And the aura size increases with Shale's con score. At later levels, it increases almost every attribute, like crit chance and spell power, as well as decreasing the enemy's armor, damage and movement speed, making your party literal gods in the aura. The only downside is Shale can't move during the aura, so you are down a party member, but he does generate threat in the aura, so it further protects your party. With a fully maxed out stone aura, you can actually substitute any support magic needed with this, since most fights, you will take so little damage you can forego healing. You do need to know when to use it, though, too, as there are some battlefields so big it's not ideal to drop it, since you'll have to move it two or three times in a fight. Now to go deal with the mage CEO herself, Flemeth, every mage outside of the circle besides my waifu is not safe from my blade of vengeance. Donald, someone pointed out how you're entirely pro-Templar but still a Morgan simp, and I too am a bit confused at your stance now. I may hate all mages, but I am just a man, Barack. If I see a goth mommy with a Darwinist mentality, all of a sudden I'm blind because I can't see nothing else. You know, given what we know, there's no reason to kill Flemeth here, we know from Inquisition. Even if we spare her, she is no threat to Morrigan. Joe, that's metagaming. From what our warden knows, and his relationship with Morrigan, I don't see why he would spare her. I would never pussy out on an elite boss or lie to my beloved Morrigan. This was only going to end one way. So this is the one relationship you won't lie to? Got it well fired up, editor. This should be good. All right, boys, so I'm going to prop Shale Stone Aura right on top of Flemeth so our boy can take all her dragon bullshit. 
Honestly, Donald, you picked a good team for this. Wynn and Shale are going to be needed to keep our warden alive at the level we are at. Also, it's kind of crazy. We are almost 10 hours into a game called Dragon Age. And this is our first dragon, though. Granted, we could have picked a different mission to fight a dragon earlier. Just wait until you play Tactics Ogre. And the only tactical ogre is the final boss. Also, Donald, did you use a greater warmth bomb on our warden? I thought those were cheating. Joe, as I said an episode or so ago, I am not afraid of throwing stones in a glass house since I stay strapped. I am man enough to admit that. As long as you are aware of it, big fella, I will take my award for the Ostagar Ogre fight now. Well, while I take care of this old witch dragon here, you have any more divine knowledge to bestow on us, Barak? Well, the main thing I can share is there is a few ways to cheese this fight. If you run a far enough distance away, the only thing Flemeth can do is throw fire at you, which if you have enough fire resistance makes it negligible. Going a bit further to where Wynn is currently placed in our game around the back of the hut is the ideal safe zone. Spamming the storm spells and ice arrows can cheese your way, even on Nightmare. It's perfectly possible as well to beat Flemeth one-on-one -on -one with Arcane Warrior on Nightmare, assuming you are fully decked out in Wade's superior dragon plate armor, since Arcane Warrior is just that busted of a spec. Personally, viewers, just like the mage hideout, I recommend taking out Flemeth in the mid to late game. Once you have your end game, armor and storm spells. Thanks for that, Obama, but Mama Trump didn't raise a bitch, so our warden is just going to hard tank her bullshit. Yeah, you say that, Donald, but given Flemeth's health bar and the amount of potions you have gone through, I have my doubts. You can make it through, big guy. It looks like just like the mage hideout, you are about to get clapped up by magic again. Oh, hell no. Does this bitch know what I have been through? I have been burned from my beard to my toes with fire spells and still came out alive to kill you robe-wearing fucks. There is no sanctuary that you can hide in that will save you from the vengeance I am about to smack into you. The Democrats can't save you now, bitch. Prepare to die. He's going full McDemon time now, Barry. Yeah, something tells me he has been holding that one in for a while. Honestly, Donald, I don't want to hear you call me lucky or never punished ever again because you are getting insanely lucky with Flemish AI right now. The fuck you mean lucky? I am literally using all my resources just to keep our little guy alive. He is getting mauled by Flemeth here. No Donald Joe is right in this case. It's our warden's job to tank hits. If Flemeth decides at any point to turn around and attack Wynn or Liliana, you are cooked because she will two shot them. You made a good call splitting them up far apart, but even so, you are being blessed by the threat generation. This fight. Oh, I'm blessed by luck, huh? Okay, then, well, you two Democrats can leisurely lick my lightly salted nuts because this witch went down faster than her daughter did a few minutes ago. Oh, damn, okay. I got to pull Wynn and Liliana back so they don't steal the kill animation from our warden. Now everyone say it with me. Boom, Boom easy, easy money. money. God, the dragon killing animation is peak gameplay and I don't think anything in gaming tops it. Dragon killing in two and Inquisition just never had the heart or the same feel as Origins did. Well, Donald, regardless of the luck around it, you definitely made the best case against the fraud allegations with that fight. You picked a perfect team for the job and utilized a perfect strategy to kill her. Thank you, boys. Now we can go and pick up the possession robes from the hut, which keep Morrigan's classic look, but greatly increase her magic score, defense, and cold damage. So basically, her late game robes are taken care of. The blight. Looks like Sten has some beef with us. What the hell is this dude's deal? Has he not been paying attention? We get our army, then I walk up to the Archdemon and kill it the same way we just killed the Witch of the Wilds. To be fair, Sten's hesitancy here is understandable, just like Shale. If you take the fact we are the main character out of the picture, our goal seems pretty impossible. Look, you gigantic bitch, I am not Barack or Joe. I'm not here to coddle or impress you, so you can kindly get with the program or eat a dick, I don't care which but don't you ever doubt that I'm not him? Ironically, Sten seems to approve of Donald having his head up his own ass. 
Let's go give our waifu the real grimoire. It will be a surprise tool that helps us later. Very true, surprisingly, it is relevant to the main quest to get the real grimoire, despite this being a side quest. <gasps> Mother's real grimoire, is it? I am glad you were able to find it after all. My thanks for retrieving it. I shall begin studying it immediately and unlock the power that it holds. I'm surprised to see you talking to Wynne Donald. Well, if we are going to have her around, she might as well be useful. Plus, if I remember right, we have to talk to her a few times first to start her side quest. I am just doing my part for the team boys. Yeah, Wynne's quest, like almost every other companion, has us talking about a few dialogue points to learn about her past first. Wynne's is probably the most convoluted because it requires us to talk to her about specific points, then get a random encounter with Wynne, talk to her again, get another random encounter with Wynne, then finally talking to her again will give us the details of her side quest. Jesus Christ that is convoluted as hell, and the side quest she has isn't even that beneficial or interesting. Morrigan's had us fighting a fucking witch dragon and getting late game armor made for her. Wins is all talking and we just get an amulet and a small skill buff specific to win. I mean, yeah, I won't defend it's definitely a low tier quest, but it's not as bad as it sounds if we just take it in shifts. Well, time to get our second to last companion, boys. Oh, is that what we are doing? I'm sorry, I thought I was playing right now, Barack. Donald, you can't seriously not want to recruit Zevran. He is probably in the top three companions in this game. Wait, who are the other two, Barry? Uh, well. Well, that's your opinion, Obama, but honestly, I don't even know why our warden is stopping to help this chick. We have more important things going on. I mean, it is a damsel in distress. I think our guy would actually fall for that, given how y'all have played him so far. Okay, okay fair. fair. Wait, what is that texture glitch under our little guy? Oh, right, the random birds in maps have a package that will cause them to follow Shale around if he is in our party, since birds like to poop on him. That package extends even to cutscenes, so the bird is running in place trying to reach shale. The great one has died here. Props to the anti-van crows. They are probably the only faction of humanoids in this series that actually plans an ambush of any sort. I mean, outside of the trap here, the only things that ambush us is animals and darkspawn. Well, there's that one random encounter in Denerim, too. All right, so only two groups know the forbidden secret. So, like, is everyone here a Antivan Crow, or did Zevran outsource the hit like that Chinese hitman did in 2019? Viewers, look it up. That would be hilarious. Imagine if Zevran got paid 50 gold, then he gave some other dude 10 gold to help him. Then imagine they just kept subcontracting the hit. And there's one guy here trying to kill a Grey Warden for, like, five silver. Well, they are all assassins, and it's likely they are all crows. But the lady called the Traveler is likely a member of the Friends of Red Jenny, given the note she has on her. So it's mysterious how Red Jenny is involved in the hit. Well, Red Jenny or no, she got clapped up pretty quick. We are definitely becoming a true anti-mage badass. Yeah, the two main targets are already dead. This is free. I don't think our warden can even make it to the archers with all the traps. So I guess Morgan and Liliana got this. The traps they set are doing more damage to Shale and our Warden than the trained assassins actually are. I hope Howe has some money back guarantee on these guys because they are not getting nothing out of us. Something tells me anti-van crows don't give refunds. They probably at most give the same offer home repair companies give where they won't give your money back. But they will give a lifetime guarantee that the job will get done and just keep sending people till it's done business-wise, that makes sense. Please, what you would know about business would fit into my left nut, Barack. Well, after wading through 50 traps, looks like the fight is finally over. How funny would it be if I just killed him right now? Not at all. I think the Dragon Age community overwhelmingly loves Zevran. I don't, he can eat a dick. Unless you're like Joe and you fucked up getting his approval up the first time around. Oh, uh, fine, but I'm only doing this because killing the only elf in the group wouldn't look great in the election year. This is PR, nothing more. Zevran really said, let's get right to brass tacks with the details. Bit of time and get right to the point. My name is Zevran, Zev to my friends. I am a member of the Antivan Crows, brought here for the sole purpose of slaying any surviving Grey Wardens, which I have failed at, sadly. 
Uh, looks like we had some stuttering with Liliana back there. So sorry about the missed dialogue, viewers. It's too bad because she gave a rather good lore drop about the anti-Van Crows being very influential and effective in their home country of Antiva. Sadly, all the way down south, they are kind of mid, to be honest. Well, to be fair, there is sort of a reason for all that we can find out far later. Hold on, besides Puss and Boots, why does his voice sound kind of familiar? Well, he is not Antonio Banderas, but his voice actor, John Curry, also voices Sir Landry, who we met earlier. Who? He was the knight in Denarum who challenged us to a duel right before we reunited with Gorham. Oh, yeah, that's the dude that almost clapped you up. He did not almost clap me up. I won end of story. What a random NPC for this goaded voice actor to play. I thought you didn't like him. I don't like Zevran, but his voice acting is literal peak. It's as good as the other big three, Morgan, Lister, and Liliana. One of those things is not like the other Joe. But anyway, goddamn, this dude is being so damn charismatic and agreeable. My urge to kill is fading. This guy is a professional charmer. Pause. Shut it, Sleepy, you know what I mean? I wasn't for silence. Not that I offered it for sale, precisely. Isn't there some way that you can threaten him into following you and it changes the dynamic here? There is, in fact, one way to change how this is initially set up by choosing very specific dialogue to let Zevran live by sparing his life. This does change the initial dialogue, but for the most part, it's just a way to recruit Zevran while sparing a massive disapproval rating from some companions. Probably a smart move because most people will not pass up a companion regardless of morality. Let me serve you. Yeah, speaking of morality, we mentioned how Sten is a bit morally dubious to recruit. But this is a downright dumb decision from a roleplay perspective. If we didn't met a game to know Zevran won't betray us. I mean, we literally just got attacked a few seconds ago. Yeah, it's always questionable, but again, I think most people don't skip companions because of how much story moments and lore companions offer. And also, as a lot of our commenters point out with Sten, it's very reasonable to offer someone a chance to work and redeem themselves, especially in the situation our warden is in where he will need plenty of allies to stop the blight. Someone should probably tell Zevran that the mission we are going on is for all intents and purposes very fatal. I know that's not what he means here, but our life expectancy isn't exactly in the positives. Okay, I ain't going to kill him for failing, but I do expect you to be put in life-threatening situations and either get good or die. That's the name of the game for everyone in the squad. That's why Jory and Davith failed the cut. They fumbled during dire conditions and were cowards. Okay, I don't like him, but bro said he would be only marginally more useful being kept alive. That's an accurate and a top line right there. I'm telling you, his charm is lowering my blood rage by the second. All right, I know we are hyping up this charming SOB, but it's worth because mentioning, he is 100% lying about the traps and picking locks. Bro has no skill points in either, and is a pure dex rogue, not a cunning rogue. You have to teach him to do those things after you recruit him. Always hard sell yourself, that's the art of the deal. Well, I barely understand the difference between a dex and cunning rogue, which is why I just default to you on building both of them, Barry. You are the rogue main after all. I am surprised you don't just give Barack the keyboard when you play Joe. Donald, have you even played Origins as any other class besides Warrior? No, why should I play as anything else when a male human noble warrior is already the peak of this game? You are another companion to be, then? I wasn't aware such loveliness existed amongst adventurers, surely. Yo, back the fuck off my girl, you knife ear. Whoa, Joe, it's 2024. You can't say that shit. It's okay, I got the K word pass. Joe is your main beef against Zevran? The fact he flirts with Liliana a lot? Um, no shut up. All right then, Donald, make sure you loot the Traveler before you go. She has a small lore relevant side quest that I can do further down the line. Yeah, yeah, sure. Also, I am not swapping him for the Bard since at least the Bard can pick locks and that's her main use. So not 15 seconds after the Zevran ambush, we have another Logan ambush at the mountain. Logan is fiending for our death at this point. Well, as we just learned from the cutscene, how handles all the assassination attempts? So I think it's safe to say the mercenaries and the Logain ambassadors are actually how's doing, not Logain's. And Logain, half interestingly, approved it. Half interestingly approving someone's death, man, that takes me back to our early days in 2008, Barry. Joe, for the love of God, shut up, please. Nah, nah, please, Sleepy, my dear friend, continue. I'm intrigued. Hey, Siri, please record. 
yeah, instead of trying to get back by catching us in 4K, Donald, why don't you focus instead on this fight over here? It has one of your mortal enemies, a mage, so better focus up. Oh yeah, I have to be real scared about a mage who did more damage to her squad than our based warden. Calm your liberal tits, Obama, and watch me cook. Hal and Loghain definitely got to step up their game. They really heard we killed a whole tower of demons at minimum, and then thought that two groups of five dudes would kill us. Well, I will take care of the rest of the simp squad in a moment, but first let's finish up the Blackstone Irregulars deserter quest. The last coward is just chilling in the mountains here. Good shit, Donald. Once we are done in Orzammar, we can head back to the main city to turn it in for some easy money. Oh? Yeah, thanks for picking up all the side quests early, Barack. You may be a boring rambler who spiritually and sexually satisfies every NPC in this game, but at least you have made solid moves in getting our money up. Uh, thanks, I guess. Yo, Barry, he just did your favorite thing, drop lore. Yeah, I think we mentioned it earlier, but this, this quest here is the only one besides the last quest that hinted at an actual faction storyline. Tauren, who we will meet later, is the son Ralnor, who is the current guild master of Blackstone. Apparently this whole quest isn't as black and white as it first seems, since the three deserters likely left because they morally objected to Tauren's rise in the guild leadership and his morally gray stance on the Black Stones, taking any job regardless of ethics. Damn, so we are kind of like the bad guys here. Yeah, I think it's sort of a nod at how just accepting contracts like this and feeding into the adventuring quest loop can lead you to do some morally bad things if you don't try to investigate what it is you're doing. Or you can just chalk up the actions to the grind and be proud of the fact you got your money up, nerds. Donald is demonstrating the type of victim that falls into the questing loop. Says the broke boy. Oh, good shit. Talking to this guy, Donald. He gives us a bit of a wider window into how the surface cast works. Oh, God damn it! I thought he might have been a merchant. I could sell shit, too. Well, he is a merchant, but I guess he just doesn't have any money or goods on him. It's an interesting point he brings up about surface dwarfs, as even though he is viewed with disdain in dwarven society, he is still allowed to trade a few times a year. And the nobles still use the goods that he offers, since the surface trade is vital to the dwarf economy. The surface trade has a lot of crazy minor details to it. We already said it before, but surface cast is genuinely really crazy. This dude didn't even get to choose for himself. He was just born on the surface, and his people treat him like an outcast for that. Anyways, that was disappointing. Let's go deal with Loghain's fan club. So what's the deal with this dude calling Loghain King? He is only the self-proclaimed regent. He doesn't really have an official title or stake in the throne. All right. I know you guys are about to give me shit here, but I'm still going to go for it because I have a theory here. Loghain doesn't have an interest in the throne. He says that himself. If we recruit him, that he just wants to unite the land under Enora and keep Ferelden secure from foreign powers. How, however, is Loghain's advisor who absolutely wants as much titles and power as possible, and as we will see later, has no problems disposing of Enora, since Enora doesn't trust How. I think these guys are likely How's soldiers that are propping up Loghain as king, because How told them to do that. I think How's game in this is to string Loghain along enough using his paranoia so that he can either prop Loghain up as king so that Howe is now second to the throne or betray Loghain so Howe can take the throne himself. Loghain may be paranoid and corrupt, but Howe is a whole different level of evil that is on his shoulder. Nah, that's valid. Barry Howe can suck it. Yeah, no, for real, Barack, that is your most valid defense of Loghain ever. Literally, Howe is just worse. That makes sense to me. Anyways, this dude just hit both of my trigger points. Being a low gain simp and calling our guy a kin slayer when he doesn't have a single fucking thought as to what happened in episode one. So it's time to bend this dude over harder than I did both the Witch of the Wilds today. That's just like your catchphrase now, huh, Donald? Pretty much, yeah. I, I will at that. Well, Donald, while we have some free time, do you have a comment question prep for today? You bet I do, boys, and I'm going to ask ourselves and the viewers to go all the way back to our debate in episode one with this one, because we are going to have our viewers settle the second biggest election of the year. Who do you guys believe should rule or Zamar, our brother Prince Balin, or the loser Harrowmont? You can either give what narratively makes sense in this playthrough to do, or the option that you think is the best option for or Zamar. 
If you all have been longtime viewers, you already know who I am picking. Prince Balin offers true change for Orzammar, and he is not afraid to step over the Assembly to do it. The Assembly is an inefficient government body, and Balin knows exactly how to play the game to avoid their BS. He also knows where the money is and promises increased surface trade to strengthen the Dwarven economy. He will improve the lives of the castless, allowing them to enter the military further, increasing the Dwarven military power as well. On a personal note, we will be allowed to join the Ejikan House as a noble again in Orzammar, becoming the brother to the King of Orzammar, and bury the hatchet with our brother for respecting his grind set. Viewers don't be fooled by that Donald only likes Bellin because he has a harem. He could care less about his policies or the good of Orzammar overall. I personally have doubts about how far Bellin's benevolence will extend with no one or nothing else to check him. Harrowmont may not be the choice that will on the surface benefit Orzammar, but he is still a morally good man and the person that the former king chose to be in power. He will keep the assembly in place so he doesn't become a tyrant himself and he will honor his word to us and to the people. Harrowmont is an honest ruler and the person who gave us a chance at life in the wardens and I think we owe it to him if not for our own life, but the life of our brother and father. Joe screw train, that dude isn't even likable in death. You know what I mean? He also drove our father to death and exiled our big bro Gorm. All right, good points, boys. Also, Donald grabbed the note by the gate. It starts the important quest for later to get a key item. Nice pun, Barry. Thank you, Joe. Now on to my choice. Well, personally, I usually pick whichever ruler makes the most narrative choice for my warden to play. If I am doing a more selfish or evil playthrough, I will pick Bellin because I can see that Bellin gets results at the end of the day, even if he lies and betrays others. If I am doing a more benevolent warden, I will pick Harrowmont, because I can see he is a honest and fair ruler, and I can see he was the legitimate choice in Orzammer, whereas Balin believed he was owed the throne. If I'm playing a dwarven noble, I find it hard not to side with Harrowmont. I mean, Balin did kill our brother and exile us for it, but Donald has a point that it is appealing to be allowed back into House Edikin if we do help him. However, counterpoint Donald, what if we help Balin at first gain his trust and build his hopes up, then at the final moment we betray him the same way he betrayed us? I think there is even some special dialogue if we do things that way. That sounds amazing, what the hell? Don't say that, Barack, you're gonna make me want to side with Harrowmont too. Either way, viewers, comment down below who you think the best choice for King or Orzammar is. But don't just do it for this episode. We will ask the question again every episode until it's time for our decision. And we will tally every comment for the next couple of episodes, since it will take a few episodes to end the Orzammar questline anyway. And the final tally, when the final Orzammar episode is published, will decide who is king. We will also not feature this comment question next episode and wait until the King decision is made to feature it so it isn't obvious what ruler we are deciding yet. Now, Barack, go ahead and get to our featured comment. Our featured comment from last episode comes from George Gale, another longtime commenter in our series who says their favorite romance is Josephine from Inquisition, which is a very cultured take. He says he enjoys her dialogue and romance interactions in the Trespasser DLC, as well as the happy ending, She Provides the Inquisitor. We also had a small speculation in the comments below on her roles in Dreadwolf, as well as Lord on Ontrato, whenever Dreadwolf finally gets released. Thank you to everyone as always for your comments, and don't forget to like the video too if you breathe today. Shameless plug, but good shit, Barry. Well, let's go help our future Inquisition Enchanter, Dagna. True, this is one of like the five side quests that is canon, whether we do it or not. So we might as well, right? She literally wants us to travel back to the circle after we just left there this same damn episode. Hell no, we aren't doing that. Besides, why would you want to leave the base city of Orzammar for the circle tower? You're just going to wind up getting eaten by demons. Some of us care about higher education instead of building a fake school Donald. Shut it, Sleepy, Grind Setting 101, Crypto 205, and Infidelity 303 are all valid college curriculums you Democrats just can't handle innovation. It's fine, Donald. I will take care of it during my episode as long as you never bring up any of that bullshit ever again.
She's so enthusiastic and adorable. I'm glad we're helping her. <sighs> oh, I'll go pack my bags right now. I'll be waiting by my father's shop. Oh God, what the hell is this robe wearing freak doing down here? The Maker's holy light will be spread across every corner of the world, Brother Donald. Joe, what the hell are you on about? How was that Liliana? Did I say it right? Oh, never mind. He's just trying to impress his B-list bard again. So why the hell did this dude think it was a good idea to open a chantry in Orzammar? Have you seen how engrossed in the ancestors these people are? Also, I am role-playing our guy as if we believe in the ancestors ourselves. Because why the hell wouldn't we? So this dude is condescending us right now. Wow, holy shit. This dude comes off as an ass to dwarves. Somebody should have given him a crash course in missionary work. Something tells me it's the first lesson to respect the traditions and religion of others before trying to spread your own. I mean, just look at how my girl Cassandra handles it. Great work, Donald, you failed the quest. Why the hell would we help this douche after he called our warden ignorant? Besides, we technically just saved his life. If we open the chantry in the epilogue, there is a revolt and he is killed. He probably called the people revolting savages or something like he just did here. Damn, so it's between killing his dreams or killing him. Tough choice. Time to weep what you two sowed. Wait, who is this chick? Why she look kind of familiar? I don't know. Maybe she's a mini boss or something. She does look familiar. For the love of God, neither of you two remember her? This is exactly the kind of professional transaction I look for Shall boys. I come to your chambers Hell yeah, to Donald. Family. Ladies, ladies. My Lord. The Trump Tower can see to all your needs. Oh, right, that was the servant girl we had a three-way with, which caused Bellin to get jealous and start this whole plot almost forgot. Wait, did she say, son, we made a kid in this game? Yeah, surprise, surprise, dumbass, a three-way can make a kid. Wait, now, hold on, I'm a rich, badass Grey Warden. How do I know she isn't trying to pin a kid on me? We were all there and did the deed. Donald, what do you mean? I'm just saying, how do I know it's mine? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my special guests, the presidents of the United States. Oh, damn. Maury, how have you been? Wasn't expecting you until Sunday, you lovable bastard. Hey, Donnie, how have you been? Doing good, trying to outgame these liberals. You know how it is. Joey, you old bastard, good to see you're still alive. Oh, damn. Hey, Maury, pull up a chair. Let's catch up a bit. I'm high. Wait, Joe, you know Maury Povich, too? Yeah, he's in my 80 and up celebrity book club. We are currently reading Gone Girl. Hello to you too, former President Barack Obama. Huh, I feel a bit excluded for some reason, but Maury, what are you doing here? Well, you see boys, I was having brunch with my wife in our favorite uh, DC restaurant when my paternity question senses tingled and I immediately sprinted out of the restaurant and headed straight for the White House. And now here I am. Well, that just doesn't sound plausible. And also, how did you even get in the Oval Office? Barack, he is legendary TV show host, Maury Povich. Bush gave him his own personal back entrance during his term. Wait, that's what the door with the M is for? Obviously. Thanks for looking out on an old friend, Maury, so you think you can DNA test this servant dwarf's baby to see if it's ours? Of course, Donnie, that's easy money for a guy like me. I've got the DNA test right here. Oh boy, he is going to say the thing. In the case of, uh, it just says dwarf baby here. What kind of name is that? Oh yeah, she doesn't name him till way later. That's weird as hell, but I will roll with it in the case of one-month-old dwarf baby, Donald Obama, Joe. You are the father. Damn, is this where I do the runoff stage, Maury? Your fat ass ain't running two feet. Believe it now, boys. Shit. Well, now we have an even deeper layer to the choice, boys, because we need our future dwarf king to raise our child, too. Well, that's definitely a point towards Harrowmont. He formally adopts the child as his own, whereas Pellin sort of just lets the child stay in the age you can manor, sort of pushed to the side. All right, boys, I got a level with you. I don't know what the hell any of that means, but I should probably get out of here before my wife gets impatient. She will not be happy. I went to the White House without her. Sure thing. Maury, thanks again for giving us your expertise. I will see you next Sunday on the golf field, right? I wouldn't miss it, Donnie, outstroking Pause. you is the easiest money I've made since retiring from TV. Give Melania and Jill my best boys. Later, MP. Well, I can't lie, boys. I have never been more out of the loop. How come all of you are friends with Maury, and I'm not? Because Maury doesn't have an interest in Dragon Age, Mass Effect, or your wife's books, and that's all you talk about, Barack. Now, that's not fair. I have other interests. Name two of them. Um, exercise and going out with friends. What the hell kind of basic bitch answer is that? 
Life isn't a damn dating app questionnaire, Obama. This is why we are your only friends. I definitely have other groups besides you. Your wife's friends don't count as your friends bury. Joe, you don't even remember your friends. You call me a handsome White House aide for the first 30 minutes when you see me after waking up from a nap. Fake news. Hold on, Joe. Just because we are vibing doesn't mean you can take my lines. I have got a brand to protect and lawyers on speed dial sleepy. Don't push it. Oh, so that's how it is then. Well, why are we helping Bellin's henchmen when we haven't decided on a king choice? It's my playtime, so I'm going to side with Palin. His quest is more interesting anyway, and it gives more lore that Barry's hard about. Well, both quests give pretty good lore, but Bellin's quest is way more beneficial to do because it allows us to go to the Age of Kintyg earlier and pick up the first part of a quest essential item, as well as giving us good loot from the dungeon, including a gift for Alistair. Harrowmont's quest is shorter, but doesn't have any loot or reward, and we can challenge the proving again, even without siding with Harrowmont. So, Donald, whether intentional or no, is doing the optimal play. Eight episodes in, and you still don't get that every move I make is optimal, Barack. I mean, your plays are optimal as long as you're not huffing 20 cc's of copium, Donald. But even though we will do both of the King's tasks this playthrough, I think it's more interesting to work with Bellin for now, since it will allow us to confront him and get his side of the story. Oh boy, time to get the popcorn boys. Well, I have a few more things to take care of here, so it looks like you will get the honor of confronting Balin next episode, Joe. Prove your loyalty. Perhaps you'll get the reunion you desire. Crazy how Harrowmont's bro just pops up after talking with Varda. Now here's a real second to a king, Doolin Harrowmont's main man. Never wanted to hit the skip dialogue button faster in my life. What a total snooze fest. Too bad we didn't bring Zevran here. He makes a really funny jab at Harrowmont not being able to keep his men in line. Hey, now we are guilty of falling prey to Balin too. Can't blame the average Joe for doing the same. So fun little lore fact here, boys. In Inquisition, we can learn that either Doolin or Vartag, if we make their perspective, Lord the King are still working as their second, even 11 years later through notes we can find in Inquisition. So it seems like the seconds of Lords in Orzammar really do form lifelong bonds. And that is why Gorim will always be our biggest bro, even if he can't join us in wrecking havoc in our stomping grounds again. Intimidate House Harrowmont's best fighters into stepping down. Now, why don't we take a gander at Barry's stomping grounds? I know you're taking the piss, but I honestly think the Shaperette is a fascinating lore point of Orzammar. Shapers are a cool mix of political advisors, lore keepers, and religious officials all wrapped into one. They physically record birth records, assembly decisions, and other historical events on stone using lyrium and are chosen for their work due to their high intelligence, not just born into it like everyone else. Shapers are supposed to be apolitical, devoted solely to their work, maintaining the memories and because they have such a deep understanding of Dwarven ancestry. Their work is religious in nature because of the Dwarven pantheon. Also as a nice lore touch, this room has some of the most codex entries packed into one location. This is what we are talking about, Obama. Your monotone rambling ass would fit in great here. We should stick you with the other old man and have you grow a beard out. Well, excuse me for appreciating an interesting lore keeper faction in Dragon Age. Anyway, Donald, go ahead and ask this dude about the documents Vartag gave us. He has some interesting things to say. See, Bellin is a snake. He is tricking people with fake documents. Oh, no, a politician using altered or deleted documents to get his way. That could never happen, right? Jesus, Joe, you have been in this game for twice as long as either of us. You're telling me you never fudged the numbers a little to get your way? Donald, unlike you myself, and my business was never fined for tax fraud. Just because you got away with it doesn't mean it's not true sleepy. I was in the game, too. I know how you rats operate. At least Bellin knows how to win the game. Donald, your stance changes more than our wives' dinner choices. I don't think any viewer can pinpoint exactly what you're on about. Exactly. I'm mysterious, and therefore I'm the favorite. Well, I'm actually surprised you are showing the darker side of Bellin here, Donald. It goes against your plea to get the viewers to vote for Bellin. Well, first of all, I am a man of the people and would never deceive my viewers. Balin is a corrupt backstabber. There is no getting around that I will be fair. Secondly, if I didn't show this, Obama would just yap about it anyway. And third, our viewers are cultured, and most of them already know the documents are fake anyway. 
So I will give them all the facts, and I'm sure you too will give them all the facts on Harrowmont so that we can all make an informed decision when it comes up. That surprisingly was a fair argument, Donald. I am proud of you. Yeah, good shit, Lil D. Maybe this year won't be an easy sweep after all. I was about to say the same thing, but since we are being nice, I won't lie to you, Sleepy. Well, speaking of easy sweeps, since you gave me props for it this episode, I will give it back to you, Donald. Picking up all these side quests will really help speed things along for the next couple of episodes. Yes, if you can find the tag in any records, that could do it. That could prove I'm a noble. Got to give the quest designers points here. It's cool that you can not only confirm the documents are forged, but also confront Vartag, too. It's such a classic Bioware move that has been missing from a lot of recent games. Well, thankfully, Larian is starting to come back with that kind of detail, so there is hope for the future. This dude is really our brothers. Second, though, he easily admits his deceptive grind and then stands on business saying, do it anyway. Finding out the documents are fake is one of the many ways a Grey Warden that isn't a Dwarven noble can discern what each candidate is all about. Doing just a small amount of digging shows Belen is corrupt and willing to cheat his way to the top, while Harrowmont is honest but not exactly willing to break any Dwarf tradition, good or bad. Good points, boys. Also, damn, the robust character interactions we get in Orzammer right off the bat is crazy. Almost everyone has something to say off the bat. Very true. The Dwarver Noble is absolutely a top-tier world-building origin. I'm glad we could compromise on it. Yeah, sure. Go ahead and suck yourselves off harder. Sure, the lore and interactions here are cool and more robust than other origins, but nothing will defeat my goaded human noble. Origin debates? What is this episode one? Facts. Oh shit, looks like I get to go back to our first dungeon next episode. It's pretty cool how things come together like that. Very true. And this dungeon should be even more packed than when I fought it at the start of the playthrough, so it should be a fun challenge. Maybe you will finally join the Death Squad with me, Joe? Not a chance in hell, I said in episode one, I am not getting clapped up by dwarves. Actually, it's the same place you had all that distasteful business with your brother Trian. Well, here we have our next and last companion in Origins, boys, voiced by the legendary Steve Blum. The based Uncle Ogren is a sight for sore eyes. Now, I may hate two-hander companions in this game, but Ogren is so goddamn funny as well as a tough old bastard that I can't help but want to bring him along. Ogren has a great storyline, too. The developers definitely love Ogren with not only his comedy, but the complexity when you reach under his mask is peak, too. Most of that we won't really see until Awakening, though. It's too bad we can't recruit him earlier in the storyline. Well, to be fair, as this guard says here, Ogren can't wield weapons in Orzammar, which would be a big lore break if he tried to fight with us early on, since we still have plenty to do in the city. Also, this dude's name is Loli Nar. That sounds like a website that would get this channel banned. Illegal name aside, this guy is a member of the IVO house, which means he is related to the Benstein sounding dude who betrayed us during our origin in the first episode. We will also encounter another Ivo we can meet in the Proving later if we want some additional revenge. That's a good point. We never meet Ben Stein, or that scout again in Orzammar dude is probably hiding in his room with the lights off when he heard we are back from the grave. Missed opportunity for some satisfying revenge, honestly. Looks like your time is almost up, Donald. Why don't we call it here and I can handle the rest of the city storyline next episode. That's going to be way too much combat for you, Joe. Are you sure you can handle it? Wait, why the hell do I care? That just gives you more chances to stumble. Sure, go right ahead. Oh, please, I have cooked during both of my episodes. I am going to prove that I am him next time, viewers. Good work today with Flemeth Donald. You definitely hit your content quota, and then some you earned the rest. Also, don't forget to get the writ in the stairs above you. Thank you, boys. I am glad I can finally show you my optimal plays. Viewers, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to leave your comment question on who you choose as the King of Orzammar, as we are going to tally all of your comments the next couple of episodes so you can have more input into this series. We appreciate how many comments and rewatches we have been getting, and it makes all of this worth it that we are building a community of Dragon Age fans. Tune in next time where Joe will tackle the Etican Thaig as well as the Dwarven Carta. But for now, stay safe. Trump out.